and good day. I hope you had a good summer. It's nice to see everybody back again this fall. I'm Shirley Fenton, Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. Thank you for joining us today, not only here in, in, in person, but uh, via the web, those of you that are coming in via the web. Uh, for this Smarter Health Seminar at the University of Waterloo, this seminar is based on our series of e-health strategies. Special welcome to our speaker, Brian Forster, Chief Operating Officer at Ontario MD. Proud to say, a graduate of the University of Waterloo as well. Special thank you to our seminar series sponsors, Borden Ladner and Gervais, McKesson, Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada, Smart Systems for Health Agency, and RIM. Some of, you, some of you will know that as BlackBerry. And those of you that are interested in the draw, well, we held at the end, so you've got to stay to the end. First, I have a few announcements. The next seminar in this series will be held on Wednesday, October 25. Peter Catford, VP, CIO, and Chief Privacy Officer of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health will be our guest speaker. Peter will be speaking on e-health strategies in support of psychiatry. And I have a request. Please be our advocate and tell people about this seminar. Uh, there are uh, <laughs> things at the back, there are flyers at the back, so pick one up, put it on your door, uh, spread it amongst your colleagues, uh, whatever. We want to have a good crowd for that. Second, I'm pleased to announce, oh, no, I'm going to stop and do something else first. Uh, I know that there are a few flyers for our next Health Informatics Boot Camp. Uh, they're all gone. If you want to get one, please let me know. Just come up to me at the end of the seminar and I'll get you one. This boot camp is going to be held in Edmonton in November, no, uh, November 1 through 3, and it is hosted by the University of Alberta, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, and Capital Health. It's going to be a great few days there. So. If you can make it out, please join us. Uh, finally, I'd like to announce, this is so exciting, the first recipients of our Institute's C Grant Program. The Institute established the C Grant Program earlier this year, and the goals of this program are to stimulate new health in informatics research of the Institute members, to provide seed funding to facilitate work on new research proposals, to promote research collaborations, and to increase the number and quality of health informatics related funding proposals at the University of Waterloo. So from the submissions, we have three proposals that have been approved for funding. They are the intra-echo MRI motion correction by Dr. Jeff Orchard, the, and he's in the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science. The second recipient uh, the proposal uh, was the application of learning technologies to support community-based lay healthcare workers and build capacity in chronic disease prevention in Thailand. This is a proposal from Dr. Rona Hanning in the Department of Health Studies and Gerontology. <coughs> and finally, the third project is using lexical chaining to rank protein-protein interactions in biomedical text. And this is a proposal from uh, Chris Ann DeMarco in the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science. So uh, could, would the recipients uh, please come forward, please, to, to receive their award. Now I know Jeff is here and Rona. Uh, would you please come forward? And why don't you bring your, uh, your graduate student along with you? Yes, Chris Ann is not uh, able to be here with us right now, but uh, would you join me in congratulating <laughs> our recipients? <laughs> Congratulations to all. Uh, finally, let's get on with the business of the day. The purpose of our eHealth seminar series is to examine the Canadian and Ontario eHealth strategies in detail. It gives us a chance to learn more about these strategies, to evaluate them. In June, we had an excellent seminar by Bill, Dr. Bill Haver, 
who spoke on the role of the physician in e-health. Today we will hear what Ontario is doing. So, David, will you please introduce our speaker? Thank you very much, Shirley. What a pleasure. First of all, let me congratulate you and Dominic on these seed groundbreaking awards. I can squeeze through here and to Chris, Ann, and Ron, and Jeff on uh, winning these awards and uh, carrying us off in such good fashion. I'm so pleased to uh, be here to greet uh, Brian Forster. Brian's uh, CV, or a brief uh, summary thereof, is in your package, and I won't read it. Let me just say how delighted I am that A, he's here, and B, he's doing what he's doing uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, as uh, Shirley mentioned, uh, Brian is a graduate uh, of our engineering faculty. 74? 73, yeah, vintage year. And uh, what is more, his son has followed father's footsteps. He's a 3A systems design student, having a great time in that uh, wonderful uh, department of systems design. Um, second thing is, if you look at Brian's background, uh, it's a little unusual to be chief operating officer for Ontario MD. I can't imagine a better pre preparation, the, the wonderful discipline that uh, engineering provides, particularly from this university, uh, and then uh, a substantial amount of experience in financial institutions, uh, getting the networking done. Um, you who've been at these series before have heard me speak a bit about the fact that uh, our financial institutions spend somewhere between 7 to 10 percent of their operating revenues and information technology broadly conceived, whereas our health system uh, spends about 1 percent. And if anything, you'd want to reverse those figures uh, it's just in terms of importance and opportunities. I wouldn't for a minute reduce the investment that the financial institutions are making, but we certainly must do, must do much, much more in the health sector to take advantage of information technology. Uh, some years ago, I was a director of Canada Trust, a company that uh, I loved and enjoyed uh, serving on its board because it was such a good retail bank, uh, very close to its customers. And what uh, led to its acquisition by Toronto Dominion Bank was the convergence in financial institutions and a very attractive price for a very well-managed retail bank. But I served as uh, on the board of directors so to uh, chair a committee on information technology. And we found through the 80s and into the 90s, the investment decisions that we were making on information technology were absolutely huge. And it was a company that if it made a 75 to $100 million decision in a year on a specific set of architecture for information technology, it couldn't get that wrong. That was just a very big investment. And those investments were getting larger and larger and more complex larger bank can make a 75 or 100 million dollar investment and make a few mistakes uh, and it doesn't uh, put the company at the brink but for a smaller retail bank those investments were absolutely huge by and large they were done well but that world was getting more and more complex and Canada I think is a leader in information technology and financial institutions we should be a leader in information technology in the health sector and we are not and how fortunate we are to have Brian doing exactly what he's doing I've also told you the story of how important it is to build this knowledge in to our educational institutions, whether it be educating physicians, engineers, or any professional. Uh, I was a young dean of law at the University of Western Ontario, and my second day on the job in 1974, I had, I think, a strike on my hands because I had made a decision to invest $5,000, Jake, get this, you never make mistakes like this, in a... Um, computer and a leased line uh, from London, Ontario to Queen's Law School in Kingston where I'd been working with Hugh Lawford on a data bank, a uh, computerized data bank of uh, uh, statutes of Canada and regulations. And the computer was not in 1974 nearly as useful a tool as going to the library and looking up the law. But I was very anxious that all of our students got exposed to the use of the computer during their legal education so that when the curves crossed when the computer became more useful as a search engine to find law, they wouldn't say what's well, good enough for quill pen, good enough for granddaddy, good enough for me, but they would embrace it. Unfortunately for me, this rebellion was solved because one of the benefactors of the university heard about my dilemma and bailed me out with a check for $5,000 to pay for this. And the, the, the hitch was that decisions of that kind previously had been made by, by consensus discussion. I hadn't realized that. I'd gone ahead and made that discussion, made, made that decision. But when I came with a $5,000 check for the discussion, it was a lot easier to make the decision than it was before the $5,000 check. But then we set the, the task of, of um, doing some exercises for the students. Fortunately, one of our fellows, a graduate, had been at the Yale Law School, which was the leader, one of the leaders in 1974 in information technology and law. He said, Bob, could we devise some exercises for the students to look up a legal problem, solve it with computerized database at Queens? He said, yeah, we can do it at Yale regularly. 
we set up that problem and made it optionally available to the students as an exercise. We had 150 law students, and guess what? Every one of the 150, in fact, signed up to do that optional exercise. They were anxious that this be part of their experience. <laughs> Fast forward to McGill, where I was for, uh, for uh, 15 years as principal, and we were anxious to build information technology into the medical curriculum. Uh, but had resistance because there wasn't any money. Uh, guess what? Uh, that marvelous Molson family that had been in business for 200 years in Montreal and had been benefactors of McGill University since it started in 1817, the, their foundation came forward and provided the money for the Information Technology Center and the Faculty of Medicine gave that faculty a wonderful head start. Uh, I have a very personal interest in uh, physicians being involved in this. I have uh, two children, my number three daughter and son-in-law, uh, so number three daughter, Sharon, is a family physician who is paid two days a week to be a clinical physician in a primary integrated care practice in Ottawa and three days a week um, as to do research, uh, and including working on curriculum. Roger, uh, my son-in-law, is a uh, pediatrician that uh, is a, an emergency room specialist uh, at the Children's Hospital in uh, Eastern Ontario and Ottawa, and both of them are avid users of information technology and are so anxious Brian, that your theme of engaging physicians and the vision be there, and can I t ever tell you there's so much energy and thoughtfulness and ability in these young people, particularly as teaching physicians, uh, to learn themselves, to learn from their students, as so often happens in this world of information technology, and to reform our health system by taking advantage of these uh, great, great opportunities that uh, exist thanks to modern technology and its use. So, Brian, welcome back home to the University of Waterloo. Thank you for doing the very important work that you're doing. Thank you very much. I'd like to start off, um, I think you can sense I'm hopefully at the end of a cold, so I may have to uh, stop once in a while just to clear my uh, throat. But I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to tell Ontario MD's story on how uh, we intend to engage physicians in Ontario's e-health vision. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about where Ontario MD came from. Uh, it was from an agreement between the Ministry of Health and the Ontario Medical Association, the OMA, about 2000, so that's about six years ago now. And um, I've been involved with the organization for about a year and a half, and uh, we've been sort of realigning our direction with the ministry's objectives. And uh, that's what I'm going to tell you about is that. But our main mandate is to get primary care physicians, and I'm, we're really focusing on primary care. This is our mandate today. And those are the frontline people, the family physician or the general practitioner, and getting them to adopt information technology. And the way we focus up on that is in two ways. One is in the electronic medical record that they would have in their own practice, which we refer to, and I'll show you, as a clinical management system or a CMS. The other is using a physician portal, which we build and maintain, to get all the rest of the physicians in the province as well, they don't have to be just family practitioners, to get them connected to the vision as well. So there's two ways we're pushing the technology, but a lot of our focus is on the, fi the family care, the uh, primary care rather, the family physician. So I've got a few things I want to talk about. One is uh, what the Ontario Health Vision is, and it's being reformatted at this point. And uh, Dr. Johnson talked about uh, Canada Trust and 75 million. We're looking at probably an expenditure in Ontario of well in excess of 4 billion in the next 10 years if we're to be anywhere near successful in getting e-health supporting the health strategy. So this is a very significant investment we're looking at. I'd like to say we have a big portion of that, but Ontario MD has a very small portion of that money. And rightly so. There's a lot of things to be done to a lot of health care providers that are in that. And we have to get everybody working as a whole, as a team. So I'll give you a brief uh, overview of that. We're going to talk about where IT really fits in primary care reform, because it has a uh, a key role to play. And I'm going to talk about the electronic health record used by physicians. And I'm using electronic health records somewhat generically. I know uh, the use of it uh, can be very precise. EMR, we tend to talk about in physicians' offices and, and um, in practices. EPR might be a hospital record. 
Uh, but the EHR I'm going to refer to here is from a national survey, which they actually included EHRs, EPRs, um, EMRs, and PDAs as well. So it's a very broad spectrum. We're going to take a look at the typical paper-based office, which is about 80% of physicians in Ontario today, and um, how we intend to connect physicians to the whole vision, what the purpose is, what we're going to gain from it. Uh, making the case for CMS, why it makes sense to do it, not just monetarily wise, but the quality of health as well. And that's the more important aspect, I should say. I'm going to take a look at the challenges and barriers, and then the strategy that we're pursuing today and the strategy that we um, want to expand to as well. This is the uh, strategy that has been uh, socialized recently, and it really focuses on... Um, the Ontario and the consumer, the patient, and it has uh, three perspectives. One is uh, really the individual themselves. They need to make informed decisions and engage in the process. Uh, people want to manage their own health care to some degree or at least be part of it, some more than others. Uh, it also talks about the uh, providers and clinicians as another group. And often the discussions that go on within that group, sometimes although they deliver the product to the end patient and consumer, don't necessarily engage that individual in the discussions as much as they might otherwise and try and solve the problems without engaging them. And we have a bit of a strategy to uh, get the consumer patient more involved in it. And finally, we get into the governmental aspect of it. How do we manage the system as a whole? Uh, from the ministry to the, um, uh, the new units, the LINs out there that aggregate the hospitals within the province in 14 units. This uh, vision really um, is intended to engage Ontarians in it. And I took the view, the consumer view that they have out there right now as to how if the strategy is successful, it will deliver to the consumer and it really gives them the information uh, that they need to help manage their health care, um, to get actively engaged in it, to have the information that they want when they need it. And also a key thing here is getting into uh, disease prevention, uh, chronic disease management, and uh, health and wellness as well. So that we want to inform Ontarians so that they can take that active part and, and um, the money that we spend is more of a preventive nature as well as, as rather than a, a remedial. So, IT and primary care reform. If you take a look at the implementing primary care uh, reform, there was a, um, a seminar series, I think, out of Kingston a few years ago. And some of the key findings in uh, primary care reform, there were five key elements to it. One was multidisciplinary teams was seen to have really good support um, in achieving uh, better clinical results and that it got teams, multidisciplinary teams working together. And this is uh, one of the prime things that is the driver behi behind the whole uh, family health networks, family health team initiatives that are um, underway today where it uses a capitated model for uh, the healthcare providers working in it, be they physicians or nurse practitioners. So they're salaried, they have a roster of patients that they provide care to, and they use the various healthcare providers within that team to deliver um, a continuity of care, in essence, to the patients. Secondly, enhanced te information technology was also seen to be a key <coughs> contributor to uh, this type of reform for primary care. Why? Because it helped the multiple teams work together by sharing information uh, so that they could provide that continuity of care. But it also reduced the chance of medical error as well. And this is one of the key things as far as quality goes. And you'll notice it really focuses on quality here. We're not talking about savings or financials at this point, but the clinical rationale. The other three items, the key elements there, there's less evidence whether those provide um, much to uh, reforming primary care, and that has to do with rostered patients, um, non-fee-for-services, and this is the capitated model. Most physicians in Ontario work on a fee-for-service basis so that if you go and visit them, they will bill OHIP for the service that they provide to you, and it's paid for that way. 
The capitated models, which are the family health teams, the FITs as we call them, or the FINs, the family health networks, uh, get a certain annual amount for looking after uh, uh, patients. So this isn't necessarily proven to be better or not as far as the capitated models go. And the enhanced access, too, actually it indicates that there's fair evidence against it, that it does um, primary care. But this type of thing, uh, the 1-800 telehealth is an example of that type of thing. Although if we use these things in conjunction with the wider network, they may well have benefits in that way. And I'll show you how we can leverage some of these as well uh, a little later on. So electronic use by physicians across Canada today. And uh, the bar on the left is the um, electronic health record or EMR or EPR or however an electronic uh, form information on the patient, um, how that's being used. And the bar on the right, the more purple one, is electronic interface uh, to things like pharmacies, lab results, diagnostic imaging, um, and other hospital or clinic uh, data that's held on computers. You notice um, on the left for the electronic the EHR, it includes PDAs. So this is a pretty broad coverage, as I mentioned when I introduced, of data. It might be a, a clinical practice guideline or something. But this is what's being classified in this survey. So uh, when we take a look at Ontario and we see 24% usage um, of the EHR here, we can't get too excited because we know it includes PDAs and things like that that aren't going to be um, exchanging information necessarily between um, EHR systems that are, are out there. We think the estimate is closer to about 20%, uh, maybe probably a little below of uh, physicians using uh, electronic medical records today. And we distinguish that because if you go into a... Um, a physician's office, you're going to see a computer always in the office, but it's going to be used quite often for scheduling or for billing because those are two key ways of running the office. But as far as electronic medical records go, that's a bigger step, whether they put the patient data on it. Because quite often you'll see the computer there and then you'll see files and racks of paper files. And so that's the reason for it. The computer isn't used for the medical record. So what we see is that uh, Canada in general is around 20% uh, usage. Um, Newfoundland is way ahead. They have the advantage, of course, of being a fairly small province. So if they throw some, some good money at it, uh, they can make a significant investment. Alberta, of course, has got a little more oil money. And they've, they've also been in the program of providing computers to physicians longer than any of the other provinces. And they're actually at the end of their... Uh, first cycle of the program uh, at this point, but they've made good penetration um, in that area. One of the things that's interesting as well is you'll see that the interfaces, the electronic interfaces, is always much higher than just the use of the electronic medical record. And that's because I think physicians understand that by using interfaces to get the data from pharmacies or lab and diagnostic things, which can be done more easily. You can dial in on a computer and get into a hospital system or whatever. Uh, they see the value of that without necessarily having to automate or computerize their own practice. So if they can get into a computer easily, they will do that. And that's why the interface uh, usage is higher than the um, EHR usage. I just want to show a, look at a few other statistics. And this is from the um, National Physician Survey 2004. And it had, I think, about, um, on the other slide, 8,000-some respondents to these questions. As far as urban and rural, it's pretty, it's pretty close in most cases um, in the EMR usage. Actually, in Ontario, we see that um, rural is just slightly more than urban in most other areas, except for the prairies, the urban is used more. So the myth of the urban people using it more than rural really isn't true. It's, it's pretty much the same. As far as the um, setting that's used, if we take a look, we see the office-based one where you're going to find uh, the community physician. Uh, doesn't, it has the least usage of the electronic medical record at this point. Uh, why? Because they have to make the investment themselves. We're in the hospital. The hospital is typically making the investment. And the other one is a mix, probably quite a lot of institutional settings where 
the uh, capital purchase is not made necessarily by the physician themselves. But when it has to come out of their own pocket at this point, because of all the other competition for the money they have, uh, the adoption rate isn't as much in the office setting. The other thing we see in the solo practice versus uh, the group type practice is that the group uses the AMR more. And that makes sense because of obviously you're wanting to share information amongst more physicians. The other thing too is that there's a, a trend because of the economy of scale so that multiple physicians uh, can quite often make a less investment per doctor in order to put it in than a solo practitioner. And finally, we look at age usage across Canada as well. And we see that really the young graduates coming out are ahead, but not by much. We see the usage pretty consistent across there. And this group here is really after 65, so presumably most of them have retired or semi-retired. I think that's one of the challenges the, the um, healthcare faces today is doctors are, the median age is around 51, I think, um, average. So we're going to have a challenge um, if we can't replenish those ones that are retiring. One of the solutions is to have them work longer, of course, but we can only be so optimistic. A lot of them that I talk to are, are quite burned out at this point. So uh, what it shows is age, uh, the, the uh, doctors coming into practice now have been exposed quite often to computers more. They're more literate with it. They feel more comfortable about using it. So naturally, they would use it more. Uh, but the others, I think, given the opportunity, would certainly do that as well. So our challenge is to find out how do we um, encourage them to do that, adopt it. We find out that IT use today, as I talked about, really supports the paper records per se uh, because it's used for scheduling and billing. And what I'm going to walk you through is the, a typical, uh, what might be a, a life cycle encounter with a patient, um, family practitioner, the patient uh, for that, and we're talking about rostered ones in this situation. Uh, the patient might call the helpline service um, at night or walk into a clinic with you know, a sore throat or something. And um, in that case, uh, they would fax back by paper to the family practitioner the encounter and what the consult was. The next day, if there wasn't, uh, the patient might call up and actually make an appointment by phone with the family practitioner to follow up. Of course, the paper file is pulled out so then you have the appointment. At the appointment, um, the physician may issue a prescription, which is given to the patient, taken to the pharmacy, again, paper-based. Uh, with Bella 102, the pharmacist could consult with the patient as well on the medication, in which case what we're looking for is feedback faxed back to the physician as to what that was about. They also have a, uh, a lab requisition, paper taken to the lab, stuff facts back again. That, of course, because it's an encounter, the physician is going to bill that. Oddly enough, the only line that's really computerized here is the green one, which is the billing. <laughs> that's pretty well defined. It's a very important one as well. Um, uh, but there's other information, and it's paper-based. It's the roster and the information back and forth. So, as we can see, the central device here is the fax machine and the telephone. The physician may decide to send the patient to a specialist. Again, it's the phone and it's paper, back and forth. May decide that a hospital stay is required. Again, an appointment and paper discharge. It's the fax machine that is the primary device along with the phone that exchange the information between the family practitioner, the primary care doctor, and all the partners that they work with externally. So, how do we change this? This is what the vision is and this is what our mandate is to, to do. Why do we want to implement an EMR in the first place? We can reduce cost, it supports medical decisions, allows sharing of the information. We saw that on that, that one slide about IT, that it's very important to share this information. Um, it facilitates aggregation of patient information so that we have it um, available at one place and we can see it, not just one person, but all the people accessing the record as well. It integrates decision support into it 
And this is one of the key things about reducing medication errors, that type of thing. And it also creates an information platform which can be used for research purposes and aggregation of detailed information uh, to come up with better approaches. So, to get away from the paper office today and all those flows that we saw, we need to integrate the scheduling and billing, which is on the computer today, with the electronic medical record. We need to connect that EMR with the external applications, all the uh, connections that we saw. And also, um, the technology is important, but we have to get the people that are using it, the physicians and their staff, to feel comfortable with it and to use it on an ongoing basis. So we have to support them in that transition. And it's not just the first part, but it's the ongoing one to get them to do more and more with it on an ongoing basis. Because this stuff changes all the time, the rules change, and uh, there's a lot of good best practices to share as well. So, how do we do that? And this is a key thing that Ontario MD does, is we <coughs> write specifications for the clinical management system, which has three components, and this is what we define it as a CMS. It has the electronic medical record, billing, and scheduling, and they must be integrated. <coughs> we have a specification that is made up of about 245 specifications uh, that cover these areas. And in order to be funding eligible, uh, we also give money away to uh, physicians to purchase these systems. Um, they have to meet the criteria that we define. Now, in making the transition to using EMRs, there's really about three phases, and we're really focusing on the first one, which is internal to the practice, because what happens there then is the EMR is put in and the people on the team, be it a, a family health team or a, a family health group, which is the fee-for-service ones, can start to share this information amongst the physicians, the nurse practitioners, etc. The second stage is to get the primary care family physician hooked up to the specialist in the hospital and starting to interchange information that way. And this is where when we see the vision, we'll find out we're not quite there yet because we have to build interfaces, we have to get the software talking to one another. That tends to be done mainly by fax still today. And thirdly, the holy grail, I think, Dominic, you called it, is the interoperability uh, for sharing of information amongst healthcare providers. And I think if you were probably at Dick Alvarez's um, Canada Health InfoWays talk, you'd probably talk about the longitudinal EHR record, which is either a virtual or where a record is stored, and it pieces together all your history in one spot. So I'm not sure when we're going to get there, but that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> a big task indeed. So this is the vision the way I've sort of presented, and this is my artist conception of the vision, and um, it's based on a lot of the initiatives that have been defined in the Ontario Health Vision, which is still in a draft form and is being discussed, but the, the flows are the same. The workflows are the same, but what we've done now is we have a CMS system at the family practitioner. When you want to talk with a specialist, which again is another doctor, and we can fund that, um, we can exchange them information between the CMS systems. Or if you go to a clinic, we can change again another physician. We can change, exchange information between the CMSs. If you go to a hospital, we're building linkages to hospitals to hook into their EPRs or electronic health records. These things um, we're working on aggressively today to do that. The ones in the green ovals are more or less the things that need to be built in Ontario's eHealth vision so that instead of faxing back the consult, it can electronically pass it back to the CMS, build the interface and pass it back. With pharmacies, um, we have an online drug viewer today that's um, in place, but it's in emergency uh, rooms and it's only for the drug benefit program, so it's restricted. We need to expand that to all drugs for all people. Um, electronic prescriptions of course. Why do we carry the piece of paper around? Well, because the person has the choice of where they go to is one reason. The other thing, and most importantly, is it has to be signed today. It can't be electronic signature, which is under federal jurisdiction. So, paper will be with us probably for a while, but these are things that 
we can get around. I mean, even today it's faxed, but it's on a piece of paper and it's stored. So um, we have to figure out ways to work with the system. E-referral. How do we get an e-referral system going? Again, uh, we're actually working. I think all the questions are at the end. <laughs> so if you can make a little note and hang on, that would be great. We're actually working with UHN in Toronto. Uh, they have an e-referral system for the community access centers to um, see how we can work with them to hook up an interface with the CMS and pilot these things out. Uh, Waitlist is another one out there today that's being worked on aggressively. Uh, PACS, there's systems um, that are in place today for um, images. We, sometimes it's talked about sending the image, but we don't need to do that. We just need an electronic link to get back and look at the image if we want to do that. A lot of the information as well is uh, text, and then you can refer to the image if you want. Electronic data submission and electronic rostering of patients as well. So there's lots, there's huge, many, many opportunities. And the way we see the strategy unfolding is really building the CMS, changing the specification we have on the CMS to interlink with all these different targets. The problem we face is that the specifications aren't there. OLIS, for example, the online information, or Ontario's lab information system, has been in the works for about 10 years right now and is on the stage of being implemented, but we still don't have a specification because it hasn't been decided on whether it's using HL 7.3, version 3, what, what the spec really is. But when it's defined, we'll build to it. We'll have the vendors build to it. We don't build software ourselves. So we're all geared up to change our spec to, to build these interfaces and interoperability. What we need is specifications to build to. And this is a big challenge in uh, not just the specifications, but choosing the standards that are used in the specification as well. So how do we make the case for clinical management systems? Um, 75% of physicians in the York uh, region thought that it improved uh, the quality of patient care. And this was, um, I'm not sure the year that one was done, it was a few years ago. More importantly though, this, uh, it's a rather dated study from the US, uh, Medical Logic, which is the GE system now, GE took um, them over, really show that um, in several areas, the quality of medical records, patient care service delivery, and administration efficiency we're all well above 50% for the respondents in, in these cases. But this was after, this was more than after a year of use as well. And there's good reception from patients. This shows graphically though, the difference between the first year and after the first year. And you can see after uh, the physician and the office staff have, um, the other healthcare providers have gotten used to the system that um, the numbers go up even more we can see that it was greatly improved um, in the area of medical records, which we'd expect because we're putting them on electronically, that that would be the biggest area versus what was in the first year. And quite often that's because of getting used to the coding and changing the way you worked in a paper-based office as well. But in all categories, we can see uh, that these can make a big difference. So what are some of the opportunities for savings and additional revenue? Uh, there's better efficiency um, and also the opportunity to uh, generate ad additional revenue. Uh, we, to break even, a physician typically has to get about seven to eight thousand dollars either in savings or in additional revenue. And while sometimes there's savings in uh, lower staff, unless you have a huge practice, it's typically not possible. And again, in uh, reducing space or that type of thing, Again, those, those are, are, are selective. Um, and usually with staff, it's not so much um, you have less of them, you redeploy them to do other things. And the other things can be increasing the revenue opportunities. Today for rostered patients in Ontario, there's the preventive care bonus program, which if you maximize it, and I say maximize it, you can get 13,000. There's various targets, so within your rostered patients, uh, there's percentages of the number of patients in your roster that you have to achieve in order to get certain uh, payment amounts, and it tends to be in $200 increments uh, for most, but not all. 
The other area which is um, not done a lot is uninsured services. And this is uh, for things like if you go in for a note for work uh, to say you were sick or something, your physician can charge you for that service or a consultation over the phone or a prescription over the phone, renewal to the pharmacy, that type of thing. And there's a pre prescribed schedule from the OMA on uh, those types of services. But by and large, um, they don't do that. Uh, they simply because of the administrative problem. And it's a cultural shift as well. But we've seen typically the additional revenues um, in those areas are ten to forty thousand dollars a year per physician. So if you have a practice where you have one individual that's looking after all of this, it can be a very significant uh, revenue um, source. And if it, even if it was just ten thousand dollars, that's going to pay for your CMS system that you put into place. So even exclusive of incentives you can probably make a, a case for it um, in Ontario today. Um, participating or clinics rather can um, participate in studies uh, much more easily and it can be financially rewarding. And there's also time savings uh, for the physician, but not typically in the first year because you've got to change the way you work. Quite often it gets in the way until you figure out how to work with the system and how to use the codes and change the style a bit. So I don't want to, and this is why we saw after a year there was more benefit as well. Challenges and barriers, many. Well, I'm going to talk about a few. Um, we need to get physician and staff acceptance. It's a, diff it's a different way of doing things. It's, it's leaving the paper record that they may not dearly love and all that, but at least they're comfortable with it. And to replace the paper record, the CMS must provide better, better care. They must be convinced that it's that. Improve the efficiency. Do it at less cost or less net cost. You know, this is where the revenue trade-off comes in. And the system should be technically easy to do. Um, it shouldn't get in the way. It should feel comfortable. And the supplier needs to take away the, the hassle of running it. Too often we see office managers or the lead physician that's taken on the, the responsibility of the um, implementing a, a CMS, they have to become not only computer literate but network literate and communications and, and you know what, they had a pretty busy job and it wasn't nine to five before they took this on. Uh, they're busy all the time so unless we make it easy, we don't get the adoption and most of the adoption from the people that are really keen has happened. So the ones that are left, we'll see in a moment, um, are the ones that need to be convinced and need to be helped through this process. The initial investment that's required is significant. Um, we provide grants to physicians, primary care physicians today, for $28,600 over a three-year period to make the capital and ongoing investment over that three-year period. There are about 17,500 physicians, active physicians, both primary care and specialists in Ontario. We're looking at a bill of about 500 million just for the acquisition and startup cost, which is conversion of records and going on an ongoing basis training uh, today. We have a fund uh, in Ontario MD of 81 million to provide grants. So if we want to computerize the rest of them, uh, and this includes not only the acquisition of the hardware, but also the transition support, the people to help them through the process in making the selection and getting value out of it. We estimate that at $3 million a year. We need another $450 million over the next uh, 10 years in order to complete uh, widespread adoption amongst the community physicians, specialists, and uh, family practitioners, primary care. In addition to that though, and this is what Alberta is experiencing today because they're at the end of their POSP or physician office system program, um, nobody's too sure who's going to pay for it now because the, the funding period is ending. So how do we keep this ongoing sustainability? What does it, who's going to pay for that? And um, we estimate that at the 17,500 about 8,000 a year if you're using a leased type of model 
um, it would be about 140 million a year. So our target is to figure out, Ontario MD's target is to figure out how do we build a sustainable model to fund this in the future so that not only when we've given the money out, that the physicians will keep on using it effectively as well and that it won't impact them. And too often, the, the physician view is that, yes, the system saves money if we do this, but it doesn't save us money when we do this. So there's savings to the healthcare system as a whole, but we have to figure out how to channel those savings from the system as a whole back to fund the people that are operating it, be it the physicians or whomever. So that's one of the challenges in coming up with the business model. The knowledge and time, I, I sort of touched on this, that's required to convert a busy medical practice. A lot of complex decision making. It's always interesting, there's the one joke about um, the computer salesman and a car salesman. And the car salesman knows when he's telling you a lie. The computer salesman quite often doesn't. And that's the scary thing is that um, it's, it's a very, very complex decision making process. And so that's one of the things that we do is we try and help the physician through that process. And it's not just the setup or the, the decision out there uh, to find a, a vendor and then find one that fits your needs, but it's um, getting the implementation. And Ontario MD doesn't do the implementation, but we work with the physician through that process to make sure it's being implemented properly. And then once it's implemented, we work with the physician as well in order to for them to get the best use out of the system as well so that they progress from paper records to uh, a more electronic office. Somehow, I went to the end. <laughs> Let me back up a little bit. There, page down. Standards, very, very important for coding the information. Right now, different systems use different standards. Well, it's not bad if you choose the right system for you, but if you want to chain, exchange information in the interoperability environment, we've either got to get coding filtering systems or we've, we've got to figure this out, hopefully adopt uh, less standards, but ones that are useful to um, all the people. The inability to access clinical information from other healthcare providers. This whole connectivity thing, it, and when I talk about connectivity, I'm not talking about the wire, but I'm talking the connection from an application to an application. This to me is one of the huge barriers because the physicians are saying, well, I can't see the real reason to invest because that electronic connection doesn't exist. I'll still have to fax. So what's the point? And they're right. And that's why most of them aren't adopting today. We've got to get those connections built. And probably the next big one we have to have there's three big ones out there. There's the lab information, but those interfaces exist today. Those exist in the clinical management systems we have. Diagnostic images are one, but that can be done relatively simple through um, internet access to PACs and that type of thing at institutions. The third one, though, are um, drugs we covered. What's the other one? I had it on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> Uh, referrals, referrals between specialists and that. Um, and that's, to, to us, that's one of the critical ones. That's the one that ties into wait times um, and between the primary care specialist or the primary care physician and the specialist because that's where a lot of the communication goes. Hospital discharges is another one as well. Um, and that's, that's a, again, a referral though, typically. So we think that's one of the, the huge opportunities. OLIS is built, we just need to get it implemented. E-referral um, is being piloted in some ways, but we need to really get a specification. We need to figure that out. But one of the things that is a real problem is that each hospital is legally liable and has its own security policies. So the problem isn't technical in hooking these systems together quite often. It's legal policy issues on what the authentication is for people coming in and all that. So while you may get access to that hospital, if you want to go to that one, you have to use a different password and a different this and a different one there and there and there. So try and hook them all together, huge problem. What we say is single sign-on, we need that. That's the kind of thing that SSHA, Smart Systems for Health Agency, is working 
on to solve those problems about how to connect it all together, how to have that infrastructure and backbone. So this connectivity is a huge issue, not only because of the applications not being there, but the infrastructure not necessarily working because of policy issues and things like that. Um, extra costs as well. There's other things that um, may be involved in uh, going to charting the way it's done, either you do it yourself or dictation, that type of thing. So you uh, really have to be careful in, in choosing a system that you're not um, going to have costs, uh, hidden costs, that um, you hadn't anticipated. The adoption progress, well, I always say life is a binomial curve. And um, there's the early adopters, which are the ones on the left. And they're the keen people. They recognize value or they don't recognize all the problems they're going to face but want to do it anyway. And they get on with life and um, automate. Then there's the people that will never do it. Um, they don't want to or they're about to retire and say, I'm not going to do that. And then there's all the rest of us in between, which are about 80 percent. <laughs> and um, as I said earlier, we're at about the 20 percent mark. Probably about 20 percent of physicians in Ontario are automated uh, with EMRs today. So our challenge is to get the rest of them to do it. And to do that, we have to fulfill the things that I talked about before. Have a good reason, get beyond the funding issues, and not just the acquisition, but the ongoing sustainability. And so we're about here. We've got this steep curve to go. We have to get that $450 million uh, that will fund that acquisition and provide the support services to do it, get the specifications in place, get the applications built, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the vision, part of the strategy, and it's not trivial, obviously. So, Ontario MD, what our adoption strategy is. Um, currently, we have four components to it. The uh, clinical management system. I'll go back a moment. Clinical management system, we talked about transition support to help them. Our physician portal, we uh, work with smart systems as well for infrastructure. And we have the funding program, which is the money to help drive the adoption. We have a comprehensive strategy uh, today, which supports the physicians to um, implement the CMS, but we have to make sure that we're working with them after they implement it to optimize the use as well. In order to uh, convince the government, the ministry, that that 450 million that we need is well spent, we have to define metrics that show that CMSs provide clinical value as well as financial benefit to the system as well. So we need to, to find baseline before a CMS a year or two years after in order to show that there's benefit to providing the money. And that will help us secure that additional funding, which is so important to get it out to everyone. The physician portal as well. In the meantime, and also for specialists, we need to get IT to them and connect them to, to applications out there. And that's the whole intent behind the physician portal. It provides medical journal data, practice guidelines, and I'll give you an example. I'm not going to give a demo of the portal, but I've got slides that I'll show you in, in a moment to what that looks like. And we're going to expand the specifications in uh, the CMS to work towards interoperability as those things are defined. And the final one, which isn't in our current mandate, but we think is critical, is to promote physical adoption by getting patients to encourage their physicians to automate. And uh, we use a patient-driven model, what we call the patient-driven trusted advisor, the trusted advisor, and I'll go into detail a little more on this uh, at the end, is that the, the physician is the primary trusted advisor, but all the other healthcare workers that you work with, be it uh, nurse practitioners, dentists, chiropractors, whomever, can be in that circle of care as well. And we base it on the success that retail banking has had uh, from the consumers in that 10 years ago, if you did banking, quite often it was through your ATM or face-to-face -face at your retail branch. Today, nobody likes to go to the branch unless you have to, to sign something or, or uh, pick up a loan uh, papers, that type of thing. But today, we do a lot of our, our interaction in financial circles uh, virtually over the internet uh, as well. 
there's no reason we can't change the way we practice um, healthcare to borrow a lot of things from that model as well over the internet, consults over it and things like that. The technology is pretty straightforward. It's the policy changes and the way payments and things like that have to be changed that are going to be the challenge there. But I'll talk a little more about that. Primary care funding today, we've um, funded or committed 20 of the 81 million to um, about 759 physicians. We'll be funding about another 1,100 this year and about another 1,100 next year for a total of about 2,800 in total. That's out of the 17,000, so it's still a big job ahead of us. Clinical management systems, we have two types. One is a local, of which there are 18 certified vendors today, or applications today, rather. And those are the ones that typically reside in the physician's office or are networked amongst physician's offices or at a hospital. There's a sole um, ASP over the web type uh, application service provider one which is hosted at Smart Systems and is based on uh, General Electric's health, GE Healthcare centricity. Uh, that's too many. 18 is far too many because the question is, five years from now, there's going to be rationalization in the business. Some vendors will find they can't stay in it. We're going to be changing the specifications. It becomes more difficult. I mean, you need deeper pockets if you're going to be here because things are going to get tougher. When we saw all that automation, those are interfaces that have to be built. So our intent is to ratchet up the specification. Uh, we're going to do it next year, April 1st, as a target. First thing we want to do is protect the physician's investment by making sure one clinical management system can write down to a common set of data and be brought up into another. It won't be all the data, but it'll be most of it so that if a vendor does go out of business, the physician can protect the investment and move to another one. So that's step number one. As specifications are defined, we will build the messaging in order to connect the applications to all those little green ovals and things that I showed in the uh, diagram. The other thing is business continuity. We're building that in so that um, a physician that might have a system in their office can back the data up at smart systems, and if the office burns down, they could use a CMS viewer to view that. Transition support, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. That was the one where we provide help to the physician. Um, and we go through steps of planning through to um, acquisition implementation. Physician portal, um, I've talked about uh, some of the things that we have on it. And this is open to all the physicians in Ontario. Um, one of the key things, this is housed at Smart Systems and it uses a registration system and the registration is authenticated. So anybody logging into the physician portal is either a member, a physician of the OMA or staff that that physician has authorized to use the portal. So if they're communicating to some other healthcare provider in some other community, uh, nurse practitioner, that you know they're authenticated and that's the important part of it. That can either be done through the CMS or over the portal that we have. As far as things that we have on it, we have a home page. And depending upon the physician's specialty, if he's a cardiologist, he or she, that information that we have on it, current um, information, comes up and is tailored that way. So if you're a family practitioner, that page would look different for you. You can change the specialty, but it comes up that way. We have a, a group of physician advisors who are continually working on this and we update this information throughout the week. It's current information. It's not a lot of um, uh, old information, that type of thing. We categorize um, information by disease centers. So if you're looking for information for various disease, you can choose the particular disease and then it will pop up and give you information articles about that as well. We get into clinical practice guidelines um, are on the system. We get into information on uh, the ECPS, uh, drug monographs. Um, we have information on all the primary care models. So if physicians are trying to determine do they want to become a family health team or not, uh, there's a lot of very complex rules. We have that information <coughs> on the portal. We have models to compare the features so that we can help them make the decisions. There's the legal agreements that they're going to have to sign with the ministry, et cetera. That information is all available and linked. Uh, one of the things we also do is that 
we talk about the opportunity to gain um, or learn about or, or get additional revenues. We talk about preventive care bonus. We have the ability to click on that, find out about what that's all about. Not only that, find out providers that can help you actually do that for you as well so you can subscribe with them. We have the information on the clinical management systems, who the vendors are, the different applications, that type of information. Uh, we have forms library, hundreds of forms out there. So this is the one. It doesn't send it anywhere, but at least you don't have to have it on paper file. You can print it off. Ideally, we'll get into forms engines later on. And not only that, the CMS will fill it out, pre-populate it, and you finish it off. But um, that's not going to happen next year. That's so down the road. This shows an example of how the portal that we have or the CMS um, can be used to hook up to the uh, Ontario Lab Information System, for instance. Those green ovals, this is how we start to get that communication and connectivity working uh, so that the physician can order it. It tells them when it's uh, ready. They can then pull the information back or transfer it to their CMS system as well. The patient-driven strategy, um, we think this is really key to many things, but what the reason we came up with it in the first place was to have consumers become more engaged with their family practitioner um, from a, several aspects. One is uh, so that they could have access to their personal health record, we call it, which is a summary of information that's on the um, the physician's EMR. It's not all the data. They're certainly not going to give them their notes or billing notes, that type of thing. But um, <coughs> clinical data tends to be the stuff in the uh, uh, CPP, the cumulative patient profile, that type of thing. Um, we feel it will promote the adoption of the, um, of the CMSs uh, by having the patient, in effect, um, encourage their doctor to have this so they can write the information from the CMS up to the personal health record. And also, uh, we see it promoting health and wellness and chronic disease management. And I'll show you a picture about that in a moment. Um, so we believe that uh, by going to a single patient portal, because there's a lot being developed out there today, uh, a lot of hospitals are doing their own, um, it, uh, it's a good common point. And I'll show you how all that works in a moment. A key thing here, though, is that the consumer, the patient, controls access to the file not the institutions having sharing agreements. And this is a key problem today. And, so, and it's consensual. It's consensual. If you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't, you don't. If your physician doesn't, that's fine. But you may bug them enough that they decide to do it or, or she will. So it solves that problem. But the rule here is that if the clinician writes the data up, you can't change it. You can annotate it, but you can't change it. Otherwise, it loses its clinical value and we're lost. But there's a lot of other areas that you can use for journals and things of, of your own record keeping as well. So how does it work? Well, we start off with the CMS. And what happens is you have an agreement with your physician to upload the data from the CMS. And it's an electronic consent agreement. But, and this is where you start to build up your personal record, which has immunization data on it, medication, et cetera, et cetera. But you can invite other trusted advisors into that model as well. And to start with, the family practitioner deals with a lot already today who, as we saw, transmit the information on paper to them by fax. So it gets into the system and a lot of that information will get to you. But we see that a link to the pharmacies is very important because now you get your drug history up there as well. And not only that, but now the physician can actually see if you filled the prescription and um, if, when we get into the chronic disease, how you're um, adhering to the medication program. We can also get updates from hospitals and the ECHIN, which is the Electronic Children's Health Network, it was actually profiled in the Toronto Star on the weekend, I believe. Um, Smart Systems talked about it, um, about how to use ECHIN, because right now a lot of pediatric data, it's used for, for, for pediatric data from hospitals. And basically what it's doing is throwing away the adult data. It's there, but it's, they're just filtering it off because that's not its purpose. But this system could be changed fairly easily to harvest a lot of the information from hospitals um, to build those records. Uh, but it's not at all the hospitals, so there's a lot of implementation work still to be done in that area. Then you, as uh, controlling it, 
can show who accesses it, who sees what. You may not want them to see everything. You may want them to see parts of it. But you're the person, the patient is the one that controls access to the record. And it's available worldwide, obviously. If you go into any ER, any clinic, anywhere, if the internet is there and where isn't it these days, it's accessible. And it's other healthcare providers as well can get in on this. Not only is it used for health records, we see it leveraging a lot of the assets out there in Ontario today. The telehealth, there's no reason when you call that you can give them a PIN number and they can look up your record, annotate it, and then there's the file builds. Healthy Ontario is out there today. It promotes health and wellness, but we could build it up with more information that's vetted by healthcare professionals. We could get assessment tools on it as well. Uh, you could compare yourself to the population as a whole that are participating in it, obviously. And updates to OHIP. One of the biggest areas, though, is chronic disease management. There's a lot of programs that are being done today by hospitals engaging patients. The take-up is really encouraging. We need a point to leverage all this good work that's being done so it can be shared everywhere. Um, and also hooking up medical devices, too. Uh, if you're using one at home, it could write to the record and alert your healthcare team as to um, issues. The vision we have as well is, is um, your BlackBerry sort of calls you up. We know we've achieved all this. When your BlackBerry calls you up and says, walk two blocks, turn left, they're expecting you in emergency. So that's, that's, that's the ultimate goal. And it's doable. Lastly, we see interaction between the patient and the physician electronically, setting up your own appointments, doing consults and changing information as well. The technology can be done. The issue is policy and business model. That's the real issue. And that's it. Thank you. It looks like uh, you've created a lifetime opportunity uh, in this thing. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, I'll start with a question. I just want to ask you a quick question on numbers. You use the figure of 17,500 physicians. I thought it was more like 35,000 in the province. Is that physicians with offices or? There's, uh, in the OMA, there's about uh, 24,000 members. Okay. And of those members, uh, there's about 17,500 active that aren't, right. in, that aren't um, necessarily uh, research, institutional, that type of thing that are practicing uh, with patients. And that includes hospital-based versus private um, practice and so What we call active, that would need um, EMR, EPR, EHR, that type of thing. Okay. And how many primary care are among that? I think I said 9,500. 9,500, yeah. okay. Very interesting. Questions, uh, ask you to be patient. We'll get the microphone to you. Uh, Shirley will bring it up that side, now up this side. So uh, questions from any of you? Before uh, you ask a question, just make sure that you hold the microphone uh, fairly close to your, yourself and uh, towards yourself and uh, to speak into the microphone. So, uh, Dominic, do you want to get the first person? Or you? Sure. Where, where is it? It was right here. Yes, you do because you've got to record it. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what linkages does Ontario MD have um, for communication collaboration with such other initiatives as HOBIC, um, Canada Health InfoWay, all those other strategies? What is your communication and decision making with respect to um, we, these initiatives? We, we collaborate with them as much as we can. For instance, health, the Canada Health InfoWay on national standards um, is one area we're talking with them on. Um, adoption. Uh, of, of the systems, how to, uh, building that metrics I talked about, those are, those are two key ones right now. Uh, they're actually, we've talked to them about the patient portal as well and how uh, that could be used. So those are some very specifics. Unfortunately, the area we're in is the little band, if you've seen their diagram at the top with 60 million for all of Canada. All that other 1.2 billion is not quite <laughs> accessible to us. So we don't get a lot of, um, a lot of discussion going on, but we are actively engaged with them. Uh, another example is the e-collaboratory that was set up in Toronto. We've talked with them about how to work with them. Um, we talk, I, I think we are at the Cardiac Care Network uh, just a, a few weeks ago. So we're really, uh, the Ontario Pharmacist Association, we're really trying to uh, engage as many as we can in the dialogue and understand how to work together. 
Um, so I have one question about privacy and one about security. So you're talking about uh, having the consumers buying in on this. I don't know whether you've done any user studies, but I would think that a lot of people are not going to be too happy about having records that are going to be freely shared, even though there's privacy legislation that supposedly are not allowed to give it to third parties that can't see it and so on and so forth. But I think that there's going to be at least some people who are concerned about having their stuff uh, stored in the electronic form. And uh, you even mentioned, you know, tell the telehealth people your PIN number over the phone. I'm not, I can't uh, envisage people doing stuff like that. Well, um, the word freely, there, I guess there's two aspects. There's one being the patient portal we talked, I talked about at the end and the CMS records. The, the privacy issue, even without the patient portal, is a huge one because you aren't even involved in a lot of those decisions except for the form you sign and you may not see the fine print on it. Um, and the information is shared amongst health care providers depending on all the conventions that have been set up. On the patient portal, we think it's simpler because you're the one that controls it, uh, who you allow to get to it. So it's not freely shared by any means. It's controlled by you as to who you share it with. Leads into my second question, which is security. So once the information is stored in the electronic form, uh, depending on what security measures there are and so on, uh, it may be the case that your records are seen by people that you don't want to see it, and that could potentially be quite damaging. So, I mean, how confident are you in the security of your system or even physicians sitting in their office with PCs where uh, there may be all kinds of uh, electronic attacks that are going to make those records uh, compromised? Well, you, you know, it's an, it's an interesting argument, but the one we always counter with is that if you took a look at your paper record today, you might be um, aghast as to how secure it is or isn't as well. Um, just in conversations that happen and how accessible that paper record is. I think the issue is the same, and uh, it's the practices and procedures that are put in place and the compliance to those that are the effective way of doing it. Last thing as well, so you're talking about maybe fewer staff being needed, but once you do the electronic uh, files, you need some electronic file management, and the physician's not going to take the time to do that. So. Don't you need staffing surrounding that? Um, I did say I didn't think the staff would, is, is attainable very often. Um, but typically, and, and this was the, the aspect about charting. Does the physician do it themselves? Do they do dictation? Do they do whatever? And, and that's part of the challenge. And that will, it'll be different whichever practice. But I don't encourage uh, practices to think there's a lot of labor savings in those areas. It's typically redeployment. Oh, just a quick question. Um, did you, in fact, say that the uh, electronic signature was um, not allowed in Ontario? In Canada. In Canada. Correct. So where, what act is that from, or where, where is I'm that? I'm not sure the act, but it's a federal, uh, it's, it's under federal jurisdiction. It's uh, records, uh, is my understanding. Do you know where we could find that information, where I could find where it's stipulated that it cannot be used in Canada? If, uh, if you want to send me your name, I'll try and find that for you. I will but, but that's a big issue. Yeah, thank it's a very you. big issue. Mm -hmm. Questions from the web. Uh, the first question asked is, you mentioned that 18 CMS vendors are too many. Some of our physicians seem to think that a single ASP solution is too restrictive. Your comments, please. We agree with that. The uh, PHR vision, is this something a vendor should expect to see in the new specification coming in 2007, or is this long term? Sorry, longer term. It's a longer term strategy. It's not within Ontario MD's mandate today, but we feel that in order to achieve our longer term strategy, it's something that needs to be taken up with the province. Uh, you've got to understand that that thing is not just physicians. Uh, the governance of that whole application is a significant undertaking. What we've done is made a proposal to the ministry on a pilot for it. A key thing is not just solving some of the technology and the acceptance of it and how to design it, but it's the business model, it's the governance model is probably a very significant one because there's a lot of different parties involved in it. So we're not actively pursuing it and it won't be in any specification in the uh, near future.
Okay, just uh, one more question from the web. Uh, they apologize if you've already stated this, uh, but when it comes to message specifications to support the linking to regional labs, pharmacy systems, etc., will you adopt standards endorsed by the Canada Health InfoWay? Uh, those are standards, but not specifications. Uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be adopting specifications that are probably endorsed by the OHIS group in Ontario, which will be the one driving likely the um, interface specifications for the components built in Ontario. Okay, we actually have a couple more that have just come in. Um, what is your view, oh, sorry, what in your view is the single most important factor to facilitate MD adoption of the EMR? I think if you saw the slide, whole slide presentation, there's no single one. Um, connectivity comes to mind as a very critical one. It's probably that at the top of my list simply because we showed how uh, you could justify economically buying a system even if it wasn't funded. Uh, but unless you've got something to hook to, you're still going to be using your fax machine for a lot of information anyway. Then you're going to be taking it from the fax machine and typing it in instead of just putting it in the paper file. So that's probably the predominant one. Um, I noticed on a lot of your diagrams you had oh, the family practitioner at the center and a lot of input to that family practitioner, but very little output from the family practitioner with the exception of perhaps referrals. I'm wondering if your vision contains anything else to the effect of a, um, like BC is toying with an electronic patient summary and things like that where the family physician would be actually inputting data into the patient's electronic health record. Well, that's what we see on the portal. That's where we sh I showed the upload. Um, on that last slide. That's what we see on the patient record going up that way. Or when we have interconnectivity, it's the sharing for the longitudinal EHI record that CHI is, is looking at. So I didn't show that. What I was showing in, in the first diagrams was the workflow. And there were quite a few things going out about making the appointment. And the, usually it's a two-way street. You have to make the appointment, send information on the patient, get the consult report back. Connect, connect. Always, there's always two ways usually with that. Okay, another question from the web. You alluded to the fact that current technology is not mature enough to solve some of the problems. Does this mean that there should also be support for more basic research in technology and informatics? Uh, I don't think the technology, as I said at the end, the technology isn't the issue. It's the policy, it's the standards, it's the best. It's agreeing on a lot of these things. I mean, People talk about standards. There's no shortage of standards, let's face it. This is not the problem. It's a specification that contains the standard that we're missing. We don't have specifications. That's the details on how to hook this stuff together. So it's agreeing on it and, um, and starting to get the pilots underway to do it. As I said with OLIS, this, this application has been out there about 10 years. We are waiting for that specification. So if that took 10 years and it exists today, all that other stuff I showed up there that doesn't exist, you can imagine when the specs might come out for that. But there's, there is progress being made. I mean, there's the IHE group that um, is doing work on it. InfoA is doing some work on it as well. But um, there's no crystal clear point to work towards at this, at this time. Um, I, you mentioned IHE. IHE actually had a conference in Canada last week. It was Monday and, and uh, Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. That was uh, interesting because there was uh, some discussion, animated discussion between the InfoWay folks and the IHE folks about uh, what, what approach might be most effective to, to use. Um, I actually had a chance to talk with some of those guys afterwards and, and uh, re referring back to your diagram where you had the physician in the center and all of the various parties that they, uh, that they have to collaborate with, it's interesting that one of the biggest reasons to adopt EHR at all is because it's in support of patient-centric care as right. opposed to physician-centric care. And one of the things that your own statistics bear out is that physicians are consumers of information more than they are providers of it. It's uh, close to about 40% of them are happy to consume electronic information from others and less than 20% of them are happy to provide it. That's right. And it's showing up that if you look at patient-centric care, you now care a lot about the workflow that a patient is going to go through to get mm -hmm. uh, care provided to them. And the physician is one of the participants. And there's somebody upstream and there's somebody downstream. That's exactly right. And that's why you saw in our patient portal, we feel it's a good strategy to 
get that information starting to flow in well, electronic form. I think that one of the number one barriers to adoption, and I completely agree with your choice of connectivity, but I think the simple truth is no carrot, no stick. And as long as the status quo is an acceptable alternative, I think it's going to be very difficult to move that, that, the heart of that adoption curve. Because they, quite frankly, have pointed out that uh, the benefits are system-wide benefits. Oh, there's no question. Uh, but the physicians on the funding part are saying, if you want us to invest and you're going to save, we need you to share to help us make that investment. And I think the ministry is sincere in the way they're approaching it. They're just saying, okay, spend the money, show us some results, and the rest of it is there. I mean, the intention has always been that. And that's what our mandate is, is to show the metrics so that we can say, let's get on with the rest, the $450 million. Well, and then the transformation oh. costs, more like a billion. Well, there's all $4 billion I talked about, over four, yeah. So yeah. Over ten on years all the other say. stuff, yeah. 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 Okay, I have another question from the web. Uh, are there funding programs for specialists being planned? Um, our intent is to fund for all physicians, uh, primary care and specialists, as I showed the numbers on the, on the slides. Uh, today, the specialists can be funded uh, through wait time strategy as one of the ways uh, for surgeons, that type of thing, if they fall in the proper area. The other is through the family health teams, if they're on a family health team as well. Brian, um, how successful have the physicians been in, the use, in using that subsidy? Have you, have you measured the actual usage of the systems and the well, degree? That's the, that's the challenge we face is getting the metrics out at this point. Um, that's one of the objectives we have for this year is to, to start showing that. Um, in fairness, though, too, a lot of the rollouts of the um, investment are just happening at this point. Uh, we started the funding in March of 2005, or April 2005. So our intent is to, um, is to start doing those surveys to find out how effective it is. Because that makes our case to, to go to the ministry and say, listen, we need the additional money. And it's not just primary care because... We showed they got to talk to somebody who's the specialist. And so leaving the specialist out is a real um, issue with the program, as we see. In Alberta, actually, their program funded both. And so I, I think it was more, more uh, comprehensive in that respect. So we need, to, uh, we need to fix that on the next go around. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to make a point, and perhaps you can think about it. I don't think the technology is a complete solution yet. And I think quite a few people believe that. Uh, to make the case in point is that the ability of physicians to deal with unstructured information within current systems is very limited, and yet a great deal in primary care of the information is, in fact, unstructured. So that, that may be the human interface may still be a technological issue. And I was particularly glad that, uh, that the uh, collaboratory in Toronto was brought into existence, and uh, there needs to be real usability testing of these systems. Now, how it's done and so on uh, needs yet to be done, but I think that may be something. And the second thing I want to make a point about is that uh, I don't believe we have any credible evidence that these systems really do uh, save money or improve care or do almost anything. Uh, I think uh, that evidence lacking, it seems to me, your work on these metrics and your measurement of the situation is not just a necessity that, you know, I'm sure you have to do that but it is absolutely a, a real benefit to uh, at least Ontarians and maybe throughout the world as to what the effects in a quantitative sense, done hopefully objectively, of these systems are. So I, I really applaud that and I hope you do a, an astounding job of that because we need this information. Uh, it is not available on the scale uh, that's necessary and uh, without it I think we don't know how to make our decisions. So. Uh, we, we know it's an extremely challenging objective that we have, but we know it's fundamental to this whole thing. Because, you know, as you go, you saw that curve about trying to convince physicians. As you get deeper into it, they need the data to convince them to do it. Not just their patients pushing them on, but the data, because that's what they base their decisions on, is, is data. Thank you very much. And Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Brian. Thank you for coming today. A small token of our appreciation. It was a very interesting talk and uh, very informative.